Welcome to part 44 of our series, Secrets of Glessner House. In this installment, the first of two, we will discuss the dining room furniture, starting with its design and history. The dining room was the heart of the house when it came to entertaining. Francis Glessner gathered a fascinating variety of artists, authors, musicians, architects, and university professors for eight course dinners that must have featured enlightened conversation. That will be the subject of a future video. The dining room measured 18 by 27 feet, making it the largest space in the house. As seen in this floor plan, it is extended with a bay window facing into the courtyard, making it 11 feet longer than the parlor and kitchen wing to either side. This provided adequate space for the table when extended to its full length of 16 feet. The furniture, constructed of quarter-sawn white oak, was designed in the office of architect Henry Hobson Richardson. This excerpt is taken from the office logbook that recorded every drawing made for the house. It shows a total of six furniture drawings prepared between April 18th and May 10th, 1887, including one for the table, two for the sideboard, and three for the chairs. John Glessner notes in his writings that the dining room furniture was designed by Charles Coolidge, one of the three architects working for Richardson that reorganized the firm as Shepley, Rattan, and Coolidge following his death in 1886. In the early 1890s, Coolidge moved to Chicago to open a local office for the firm to oversee two major commissions they had received the Art Institute, and the Chicago Public Library. He and his wife became close friends of the Glessners and frequently dined at the table he had designed for them. Richardson had a long-standing collaboration with A.H. Davenport & Company, a furniture-making and interior decoration firm based in Boston, and they were engaged to make all of the new furniture for the Glessners' home. Here we see several examples of their furniture, created by their chief designer, Francis Bacon, who had previously worked as an architect in Richardson's office. He designed several pieces for the Glessners, including the piano. The firm had an outstanding reputation and received many prominent commissions across the country. One of the largest consisted of 225 pieces of furniture and decorative items for the Iolani Palace the royal residence of the rulers of the Kingdom of Hawaii, completed in 1882. Much of the original Davenport furniture is still in place, including the dining room pieces shown here. Two decades later, architect Stanford White engaged Davenport to make the furniture for the state dining room at the White House during the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. The commission included two tables, six armchairs, 50 side chairs, and three serving tables. Most of the pieces are still in use today. In a letter from George Shepley to John Glessner, dated July 18, 1887, he notes that he has directed Davenport to begin the production of the furniture. In addition to the dining room pieces and the piano, this included two music cabinets, the partner's desk in the library, two suites of bedroom furniture, and an assortment of tables and chairs. All of the furniture, with the exception of the piano, was delivered to the house in time for the Glessners to move in on December 1st, so it was produced quite quickly, in just over four months. The final invoice from the architects shows that Davenport was paid a total of just over $10,000 for their work. There was no further record indicating the charges for each individual piece. This photo was taken by George Glessner shortly after the family moved into the house. Note that the wall sconces have not yet converted from gas to electric. It is the only Glessner era photo that shows the table uncovered. It was a generous six feet in diameter and could be extended with 10 one foot leaves to a total length of 16 feet. The substantial legs were fluted and slightly tapered. At the bottom of each, a large acanthus leaf sat above paw feet. The fluting coordinated with the fluted pilasters that flanked the dining room fireplace. 
and the acanthus leaf was a motif used throughout the house on various pieces of furniture and on architectural components. Francis Glessner left behind a somewhat mysterious note in the front of the Bills of Fare book she used to record menus for her dinner parties. She states that the dining table seats 18 people, but could be lengthened by a carpenter to seat 23. How this was done, or how the larger table comfortably fit into the room, is unknown. The dining room set includes two armchairs and 16 side chairs. The chairs are notable for their slender, tapering spindles and graceful curves, a nod to the emerging Art Nouveau movement of the time. This is especially noticeable with the armchairs, where shallow carved acanthus leaves on the armrests gracefully curve directly into the spiraled arm supports. The sideboard sits along the west wall of the room, and although it aligns perfectly with the grid of the oak paneling, it was not attached to the wall itself. The large top provided ample space for serving trays, decanters, and other items used during dinner parties. The upper shelf provided space for the Glessners to display some of their favorite objects. The design of the sideboard is distinguished by five unique carved panels. Here we see the two panels from the front of the cabinet doors. Each measures about nine inches in diameter. The panels were photographed by the firm of Kaufman and Fabray in the 1930s. The Glessners later reused one of the designs. In the 1910s, they commissioned Davenport, which by this point had merged with another firm, Irving and Casson, to make a bedroom suite for their two granddaughters. This sideboard panel was enlarged and used at the center of each of the two headboards. This image shows the two carved panels set at either end between the top of the cabinet and the upper shelf. It is interesting to note how different each panel is and yet how well they work together. This is achieved through each design conforming to a strict symmetry, top to bottom and side to side. The largest of the panels, set beneath the top shelf, measures more than 30 inches in width. It incorporates motifs seen in the other panels, including beading, which is seen on various elements throughout the house. Some have likened the design of the center panel to large waves, with the beading representing frothy water. When John Glessner died in early 1936, an inventory was taken of the contents of the house. This page shows the dining room furniture and furnishings. A combination of factors, including the Great Depression, and this type of furniture in general being out of fashion at the time, resulted in the sideboard, table, and 18 chairs being valued at just $101, a fraction of what the Glessners would have paid for them 50 years earlier. The dining room set was left in the house when it was donated to the Armour Institute, now the Illinois Institute of Technology, in 1938. The dining room itself, however, was quickly turned into classroom space. The furniture was dispersed throughout the house. We see the table and some of the chairs set up in the parlor for use as a conference table. More of the chairs were moved to the library where classes were held around the partner's desk, which was also left in place. When the Lithographic Technical Foundation took over the building in 1945, they converted the dining room into a research laboratory centered with a large built-in counter that included a working sink, as seen at far left. They moved the dining room furniture to the second floor hall, where the table and chairs were utilized again for meetings. The sideboard was also moved into this space. The left edge of it can be seen at far right. When the foundation moved to Pittsburgh in 1965, they sold off some of the contents of the house. The sideboard, table, and 14 side chairs were sold for $250. The two armchairs and two of the side chairs were apparently forgotten and left behind on the third floor, as seen in this photo taken by Richard Nickel. That is why we have four original chairs in the collection today. We hope you have enjoyed learning more about the design and history of our dining room furniture. In our next installment, we will look at the meticulous process of recreating the pieces, 
which were installed in the house in December 2023. Tune in next time when another secret will be revealed.